Success in sales is about getting in front of the right people at the right time and helping them make decisions. But it's, it's about getting in front of the right people. And what I've discovered is a lot of people just don't have the swag or the skills or the mindset to be an appointment setting machine. So I want to just walk you through some things. If I could get you to go on two to three appointments a day, how would your business be different? If I got you on two to three appointments a day, how would your life be different? I mean, look, you could be the worst salesperson on the planet. And if you're in front of two to three potentially great prospects every single day, my goodness, someone is going to say yes. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I want to talk to you about some of the lessons I learned my first three years in sales. Uh, if you can imagine, I was on the phones Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30. That's hundreds of calls a day, 30 plus conversations a day, an unlimited number of presentations being made day in and day out. Um, I actually figured it out that it was about 7,500 hours of time spent on the phone, not including the time I was doing it on the weekends. That was just the clocking in, clocking out Monday through Friday time from age 19 to 21. Well, when you're blessed, and I do say blessed to have that kind of experience growing up, you learn so much about yourself. I mean, think about it. Eight, nine, 10 hours a day on the phone. I would get in early, call the East Coast. I would finish the day calling into Hawaii looking to find customers, to build the business, to make the money, to achieve the dreams that I had set for myself. And when you're on the phone, seven, eight, nine, 10 hours a day for three plus years straight, boy, do you learn a lot. You learn a lot. Again, I'm going to say it about yourself, about what it takes to be mentally disciplined, what it takes to persevere, what it takes to uh, experience rejection. I was thinking about uh, the interview I did with David Goggins and Rich, remember the, the person asked the question of David Goggins, like, you know, how do I get over my fear of the phone? He's like, you make 300 phone calls a day. You just keep going and going and eventually you'll get over that. <laughs> you learn so much. You know what I also learned? I learned so much about human beings. And, and I could, I could literally talk for days just about my interpretation of people's psychology, you know, how they think, how they operate, what's important to them, uh, modalities, uh, drivers of motivation, internal versus external towards and away pleasure and pain, uh, you know, sameness versus difference, all this stuff that the early days of my career, uh, where I was studying neurolinguistic programming, it was like a playground to be on the phone. It was so much fun to be talking to so many different people around the country, from my case, you know, U.S., Canada, to really understand why people do what they do. It was fascinating. But I also got to learn how to optimize. Like, think about it. So I was just on the phone. It wasn't like today as the, you know, the, the first and only video first coaching company where everything is now, you know, inside of our software and we're doing everything on video and it's video, 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 because we all want to be face to face because we want to optimize the senses, right? I mean, if I can touch you, if I can see you, if I can hear you, if I can smell you and taste you, wouldn't that be great over the phone or face to face at a meeting as well? Kind of weird for a presentation or a sales presentation, but you know what I mean, right? And I know some of you might be saying, Tom, I've got that sixth sense as a salesperson. I feel that. I understand it. But when you learn over the course of three years how to really be effective over the phone, one of the key distinctions was how do you optimize the only sense you have, which is listening, right? The ability to really listen to a customer and hear through the difference between, hey, have you had any thoughts of selling? Well, versus have you had any thoughts of selling? No, right? Just that subtle shift in their tonality. You know that there's a story behind that. Most people are racing so fast, they miss the little subtleties. When you do it as long as I've done it, you hear those little things that are like, like little windows opening or little doors coming ajar where suddenly there's an opportunity for you to go in and provide value, to show your degrees of separation, to make a difference, to help somebody. You know what you also learn doing it as much as I did it? You learn about how important your environment is, right? And how your environment, like the place you work, how it impacts your energy and your effectiveness. And today, what I thought I would do on this podcast is just share with you, 
you know, some of the key lessons, some of the key distinctions, some of the things that uh, were important for me. There are things that we teach, like I think about uh, an event I used to do called Tag the Appointment Game or my goodness, the years and years and years, we did a thing called over the phone training where we were teaching people, you know, in three one hour sessions, how to be effective over the phone. And some of those distinctions I'm going to give to you today, but think about it like this. You know, you're listening to this podcast right now and you're, I don't know, you're in your car, you're, you know, at the gym, you're in the office. The question I want you to think about is this, how would your life be different if you could generate a consistent number of great appointments with potential clients all the time. Think about the question. How would your life be different if you could generate a consistent number of great appointments with potential customers all the time? You know, if you took the time to answer 15 or 20 reasons, like reasons of how your, your life would be different, or how would your business be different if you were an appointment setting machine? Think about it. How would your business be different if you were an appointment setting machine? I would argue that doubling your business would be pretty realistic. I think back to um, one of my clients. I'm actually looking at uh, two of my teammates over here. One of the clients I took on years ago, his name is John McMonagle. Uh, I think he was just named 14 or 15 on the Wall Street Journal Top 1000. Uh, so big shout out to John and his team. And, and look, the first time I sat down with John, it was very simple. We were seeing Gulfstream restaurant. It was like 2005. And I asked him, what is your ambition? What is your goal? And he gave me this, you know, fantastical number of sales volume that he wanted to achieve. And I said, what is the only leading indicator of your success? And he said, you know, I've never been asked that question. I said, no, think about it. Like, you know, you, you want to do X and volume, which means you got to get Y in signed contracts, which means you got to do Z and what he's like listings and sales. I'm like, yeah, that's the contract side. I'm like, what? He's like, oh, appointments. I go, right. How many appointments do you go on in a typical week now? And again, I'm dating myself. If he's listening, he would laugh, probably just thinking about, you know, where we were at that time in our lives. And he said, look, I'm going on maybe two or three appointments a week. And I'm like, well, what's the most you can handle? What's the most that you could really do and provide consistent, great value, provide consistent, great energy and not be completely exhausted at the end of the day. And he's like, I don't know, two to three a day. And I'm like, well, what's the most you've ever done? He's like, I've done five appointments in a day. Think about that. If I could get you to go on two to three appointments a day, how would your business be different? If I got you on two to three appointments a day, how would your life be different? I mean, look, you could be the worst salesperson on the planet. And if you're in front of two to three potentially great prospects, Every single day, my goodness, someone is going to say yes. The old line my dad used to use a million times that always made me laugh. He'd say, you can throw up on every third presentation and someone's going to go, I like that. And they're going to sign a contract. So think about it. Am I saying to you the numbers game? Yes and no. What I'm really saying to you is success in sales is about getting in front of the right people at the right time and helping them make decisions. But it's, it's about getting in front of the right people. And what I've discovered is a lot of people just don't have the swag or the skills or the mindset to be an appointment setting machine. So I want to just walk you through some things, eight, nine, 10 key distinctions, things that you may check the box and say, I'm already doing that. Things you may say, oh God, I, I've always thought about doing that. Or can I do that? Okay. Hey, I'm going to do that. And my hope is that, look, you're just going to find, you know, one or two ideas, one or two things that really stand out for you. Now it's funny. I'm actually looking at my very first point, uh, but before I share it, I'm going to share a bonus point. You ready? So this is not my first point. This is just a bonus point. When I reflect back on that time, I was in a cubicle environment sitting across from my older brother and we were on the phones every day together. And there's just something about if you're going to be effective over the phone, having someone to compete with, having someone to, you know, go after it with, having somebody to high five with, having somebody to take breaks with, having someone there that on the days you don't feel like doing it, looks you in the eyes and says, shut up, man, let's get on the phone. Let's go make it happen. Your goals are not going to create themselves. Get your ass on the phone. And I would argue there might be some lone rangers out there. There might be a few of you that are like, no, like I don't, you know, and I'm not comfortable doing it around people. And I'm not, you know, I kind of want to be in my own private environment. I can't have the noise and the distractions. And I would say to you, yeah, I get all that. And Look, at the end of the day, when you're on the phone with somebody across from you, even if they're a little far away, it's just going to make you better. So that's my bonus, bonus point. And everybody knows that's doing this. I mean, certainly I think about 
some of my clients that have uh, Dan Blackwell, uh, coal banker, uh, coal banker, commercial real estate broker in Orange County, California. He's got four or five salespeople on his team. He's making 10 contacts a day. They're all making their contacts every day. They're all making it essentially in the same exact environment. So it's loud. It's probably exciting. You know, you do the little hacks, you throw a headset on all those little things that, that maybe remove some of the distraction, but you feed on the energy. You feed on the energy. So my first bonus point to you would be, don't do it alone. Get some other people with you. Now, here's the deal. If they're not as committed as you are, you don't take it personally. You still got to do it. But a bonus point is, do it with a group. Do it with a couple of buddies. You'll be really happy with the success. All right, here's my points. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. So let's go to the very first point, right? Uh, and that is, what I learned is you've got to set up your environment to be successful. So what do I mean? I mean, your, your office environment. Now, I know if you go back to your broker and you say, look, I want to make all these changes. You go back to your manager, I'm going to make all these changes like that. You know that you might get it done. I found that being personally responsible and doing the work yourself. Um, like I just never wanted to rely on everybody. I just wanted to make it right for me, right. Without making it obnoxious for, you know, the, my manager, et cetera. So here's my list. You ready? Number one, you want to be in a stand up situation, not a sitting situation. So if you're sitting down making phone calls, could you just imagine for a moment? I know uh, you're listening to me on audio, but we're also doing a video of this. So like when I say to people, okay, we're in a seminar environment. And I'm like, show me you're sitting at your desk, making phone calls. Everybody immediately slumps over and grabs their phone. And I say, in that slumping over position, are you in a powerful state? Are you in the kind of state where people are like, oh my God, I can't wait to talk to this person. I want to book a bit, you know, book an appointment with this person. The answer is no, right? We know that 55% of your total communication, 55% of your total communication is what? The way you move your body, right? So if I'm standing up on my presentation, I'm going to be more animated. I'm free to move my arms because I'm also wearing a headset, right? So physiology, right? The way you move your body, absolutely like... You've watched me on videos before. I'm smacking my hands. I'm moving my body. Like when I was on the phone, I was talking to somebody 3,000 miles away, but I was acting as if they were standing right in front of me. Like I'd reach over and like grab their shoulder, right? I'd give them a high five. I'm like, come on, man, let's go, right? I was physically engaged in the presentation. You can only do that in a standing environment. Number two. Presentation should be up and visual, ideally looking up, you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees up. Think about that. If you're using a presentation, right, a script, right, a talking track, whatever you, whatever you say, you want to have it up. Why? If I'm standing and I'm looking up, my shoulders are back, my chest is up, I'm more likely to be smiling. And what I'm doing is I'm standing in a confident state, almost as if I put a superwoman or superman cape on your back, dun, 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 and you're on the phone, standing there, going through your talking points, going through your script. And you know what you're doing? You're projecting confidence. You're projecting confidence over the phone versus, oh, slumped over, sitting at my desk, making my phone calls because I've just got to get through this. I hope they don't answer. You know what I'm talking about. You want to stand up. You want to have that energy. Third thing is my goals were always up and visual in front of me. I actually created a, uh, a phone board at one point. If you can imagine, you go to like Staples and you buy one of those presentation boards. You open it up with the little flaps. And on the left side, I had a picture of Cal Ripken Jr. If you remember Cal Ripken Jr., he had, he had like the record for playing in the most baseball games ever. And I had like the number there, 2000 and whatever it was. And the reason I have that up was I wanted to be the Cal Ripken of appointment setting. I wanted to be the Cal Ripken of the phone. So that visual reminder there, right below was a photo of my two kids, cute as a button, one with an Angels hat, one with a New York Yankees hat. And we were in Hawaii and they were really young. And it was the visual reminder of, I am on the phone because I want to take my kids to Hawaii, right? I'm making money for a reason, right? I'm making these phone calls for a reason. So I want to connect with that when I open up that presentation board, right? And of course, I'd have my scripts or I'd have my objection handlers, my talking tracks. And I even put the world famous mirror on the right to remind me that I was talking to somebody over the phone. I was, I was technically, and you know this, I was interrupting someone's day. So it was probably good that I brought them value and had a smile on my face. Does that make sense? All right. Obviously, number four, I had a visual tracker. 
up at all times. How many calls, how many contacts, how many leads, how many appointments, what my numbers were. And back then it wasn't like we could do it today with like Plecto and Hoopla and all these cool apps that we can, you know, have with our, you know, our Salesforce or whatever CRM you use. But back then it was just a wall board that said, today I'm committed to making a hundred dials. I'm committed to talking to 30 people, committed to booking X number of appointments. And I kept all that up visually in front of me at all times. Obviously I had a headset um, there's no doubt. There's a lot of different headset companies. I always love the boom.com, the boom.com. Now today I wear the iPhone AirBuds cause they're sexy and cool. But the reality was, you know, if I was back then in a bullpen environment where there's lots of people on the phone, I needed something that like covered up my ears, kind of, um, Judy from time life magazine. If I'm dating myself or even let's go princess Leia, right? The really big ones with the microphone that came down near my mouth that also would turn on and off when I was talking or not talking those little distinctions when you're over the phone, make a big difference. I always had a living plant. Do you have a living plant in your environment? I would call it new business or new relationships or, you know, client success. And, and the deal was that plant was sort of the metaphor. Some people have the money plant, right? You've seen the money trees before. I had the, I had just the plant there as the reminder of how I treat the people I'm talking to and how I treat that plant are going to be one and the same. So if that plant is thriving, I'm treating my customers the same way. And it was just more just my heart, if you will, in this connection with the plant and the people I was talking to. I always had music playing, right? Uh, Depeche Mode, Pick Up the Receiver, I'll Make You a Believer, right? Those kind of songs over and over. I literally had musical tracks, the soundtrack to Superman. I'm going to date myself. Audio cassettes, CDs that I was burning. Now, you know, iPhone and everything else, right? But the bottom line is music creates emotion, and I want to be in a strong emotional state. So, you know, call me maybe, call me by Blondie. You know, I could just go for days on this. You with me? Like I made the music and the phone fun. Dancing. My older brother loved, loved to listen to Saturday Night Fever, right? And that album, that, that dating myself, I don't think it was the actual album, but like that CD would be playing because he wanted to do disco moves while he was on the phone. So we were having fun and like whoever booked the most appointments got to choose the music. You with me on this? You might also be picking up on my energy right now because just thinking about this gets me all fired up. Like I love the phone. The phone is my friend. The phone has made me a fortune. You with me on this? By the way, What's your mindset about the phone? How do you feel about the phone? I imagine, by the way, side note, that when I used to pick up the phone, right? Remember, remember picking up the phone? Not, not talking about grabbing your iPhone out of your back pocket. Like, remember picking up the phone and like dialing or beep, 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 right? I would pick up that phone and I would imagine the second I picked it up, $100 bills flying out of it. Because see, the phone gave me everything I wanted. The phone helped me realize the purchase of my first house at 19, my second one at like 21. Like the phone is my friend, you with me? So music, energy, heck, we even had a time for a while that we were playing every one of the first three Star Wars videos on VHS. I'm totally dating myself. I'm gonna be 50 in like 13 months, so just go with me on this, right? But imagine like you're on the phone it's the last hour of the day and I'm competitive and we are dialing and we're smiling and we're having fun and we're going through the game. And you know what? You pop on a little Star Wars video and all of a sudden Luke Skywalker, right? The force, like it was fantastic. I could watch episode three, I guess technically it was episode six over and over just that scene with Jabba the Hutt, right? Like it was fantastic. Now you might say, Tom, I am so ADD. I'm having a hard time listening to you right now. I couldn't imagine if that was playing in the background. 7,500 hours, Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30, I had to make the environment conducive of sustainable success. So whether it was music, a living plant, my goals in front of me, um, the ability to stand up. And back then we didn't have the adjustable desk like we have today. I put those like bricks below my desk and put the desk on top of it. We did whatever it took to make it fun. We actually had for a while surfboard leashes tied from our desk to our leg. Cause I know you've done this before where you're like, you get on the phone, you book an appointment and you're like, yeah, and you do the, I just got an appointment dance, and you run around your office. Well, look, when you're hot, stay on the phone. When you're hot, stay on the phone. So what I would always do is like attach myself to my desk to make sure that I wasn't doing the, I just got an appointment dance and running around. So that was all just number one, right? The next one are very easy, but that's a big one. Set up your environment 
to make sure that it's fun and you're winning. Now, major point number two, if you want to become an appointment setting machine, you got to know your automatic shot. You got to know your automatic shot. So the question is, if you had to book an appointment today, what source do you go after? If you had to get an appointment today, what source do you go after? Like if I, if I literally metaphorically said to you, you have four hours to get an appointment or I'm going to punch you in the head and you actually believe that I was going to punch you in the head and you said, okay, I'm going to call this source, this source, this source. That's your automatic shot. You know where I got that from? Um, so I'm looking at my team here in front of me while I'm recording this. Uh, the first year the U.S. men's basketball Olympic team was put together, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, uh, Magic Johnson, they were called the Dream Team. The coach of the Dream Team was a guy named Chuck Daly who passed away a couple years ago. Legendary old school basketball coach. Um, I had lunch with Chuck Daly one year. He spoke at one of our conferences. And you know, the chance to sort of meet this guy just coming after, it was maybe two years after uh, the Dream Team. And I said to him, Okay, so you took the Detroit Pistons that were certainly a nothing team at the time and you turned them into a back-to-back -back championship team. Then you went on to do the dream team. Like he was, you know, he was the quintessential coach at that time, pre-Pat Riley, P, you know, pre-Phil Jackson, et cetera. And I asked him, what was your strategy with, I get goosebumps just thinking about this. Like, what was your strategy with the Detroit Pistons? And what was it again with the, the first, you know, the, can you imagine the egos of the Olympic dream team? Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, I mean, like, just legends, right? He said it was really simple. I helped them understand where they were most comfortable producing the best possible result, and then I created all my plays to get them the ball at that spot. And he literally grabbed a piece of paper in front of us, and he's like, so here's what I did. Like, Isaiah Thomas is coming down, he's the point guard, right? And he, like, he would point out, like, this guy had an X here, this guy had an X here, this guy had an X here, and the whole goal was to run plays to get them the ball where they were most comfortable at the X, and then hope that they made the shot. Well, when he said that, I thought, the most successful people I know over the phone do the same exact thing. They put themselves in a position to win. So I would ask you, if you wanna become an appointment setting machine, there is a rhythm to who you should call first, second, third, fourth, right? Some people might argue, you know what I wanna do? I wanna start with some really old, cold leads because I want to warm up on them. I don't want to, I don't want to call my best lead when I'm just getting started and I, my mouth isn't working yet and it's 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning and I'm, right? So they'll say, hey, I want to like call some old leads that I met at an open house like five years ago. Where others will say, to warm up, I actually want to call my sphere first because they're warm and they're, fr hey, Courtney, how's it going? How was your trip to Austria? What was it like? You know, what'd you do? Right? Oh my God, Brandon, I was just looking at your pot. You, you guys don't see that I'm actually talking to my team about stuff. Like the email you sent me last night about all the things you do, like, like you want to do those warm and friendly conversations because that's what gets you going. So the point is, one is know your automatic shot, right? Know your go-to source for getting appointments. And then number two, kind of behind that is know the rhythm of how you should get started. Like, are you better to warm up with some friendlies or are you better to warm up with some people that you don't care how they respond? Like you could literally verbally vomit on them and you're like, why, thank you. I'm now awake and ready to call my most important leads. Very important distinction when you want to become an appointment setting rock star. Major point number three, multi-channel and modality. Now, understand that when I was doing this, right? You, I didn't have the advantages that you have, my friend. You can text, you can email, you can DM inside social, you can send bomb bomb video messages, and yes, you can make phone calls. Back in the day, it was like make phone calls, mail them something, or fax them something. Imagine, that was my multi-channel. The point is this, understanding client's modality, where are they most comfortable? I have people today that want to communicate with me exclusively through Twitter. I have people today that I can call them and they don't answer. And if I send them a text, they respond in two seconds. I have people that love to send me giant <laughs> thesis emails. You with me? Like doctorate level, crazy over the top, so much information that my brain wants to pop emails. And I have some people that, you know what? They will only communicate with me via video. Like to, to say to them, let's make a phone call is just ridiculous. They're like, Tom, come on, let's go all video, baby. Zoom, whatever it is, FaceTime. They don't care because they want to look me in the eyes as I want to look them in the eyes. The point is, don't be myopic in your approach. 
Don't be myopic. Let me say it to you differently. Don't be selfish in your approach. My client, Maxine Gallants, big shout out to Maxine. She's 81 years old. She's one of the most successful agents on the planet. Her and her daughter sell so much real estate with their team down in La Jolla, California. I remember being at a baseball game with Maxine, watching the Padres. She's a huge fan. Now her, two of her grandsons are uh, minor league and professional baseball players. She's a, she's a baseball junkie. We're sitting there and I say to Maxine, why do you never respond to my text messages? And she says, oh, I never even look at those. And I said, well, just hand me your phone. And she hands me her phone and I have to open up her phone. Do you, do you remember, remember opening, like beam me up, Scotty? Like whoop, open up her phone. And I'm like, whoa, okay, Maxine, I see the problem. And I literally walked her through about 30 text messages from clients that wanted to buy, wanted to go on appointments, wanted to meet with her, wanted to talk to her, and she didn't respond to him at all. Now, I'm dating myself a little bit this because you know we're not seeing many Motorola flip phones anymore, but you understand the point. She had 30-something clients that wanted to communicate with her only via text, and she was a phone person, and when she did emails, she would handwrite them, and her assistant would type them up and send them. Today, if I said, hey, let's get a hold of Maxine Gellens, I might DM her on Instagram. I definitely would text her before I do anything else, and I'd probably send a video. She was able to adapt to what her client's expectations are. So if you want to be an appointment setting machine, you cannot be a biopic and you cannot be selfish. You've got to understand that booking an appointment through DM on social, Facebook Messenger and or you know uh, Instagram Messenger is just as good as making a phone call and saying, I'll see you Tuesday at four. Does that make sense? Number four, you want to focus on building an extraordinary amount of rapport in 60 seconds or less. Now, if you never read the book, Instant Rapport, and I can't think of the author's name, but if you Google it, it'll be that guy. Basically, the thesis of the book was people want to do business with people that are just like them. People want to do business with people that are just like them. The challenge is, let's go back to the context. I'm calling you over the phone. I'm trying to get you over the phone to do some, you know, to book an appointment. So I'm interrupting your day. Now, when I'm interrupting your day, I'm not building rapport. So when I get up, when I get there, I've got to be super focused on what matters most to connect and get that appointment. So let me give you the first one. You ready? The first one is, do they talk fast or do they talk slow? Look, first of all, do you talk fast or you talk slow? You can clearly say, I'm a fast talker, right? Now, do you know that slow talkers actually think fast talkers are just city slick and salespeople trying to sell them something? And how do fast talkers think about slow talkers? They're like, let me ask you a question and go ahead and answer it for you. What the hell's the matter with you? Speed up, let's go. It's a disconnect in rapport. Well, no appointment is booked and no sale occurs without some level of connection, trust, rapport. So are they fast talkers or are they slow talkers? Another one I always paid attention to over the phone is, are they visual, auditory, or kinesthetic with their language? Meaning, do they use language of visual? I need to see something first. Why don't you come over and take a look at what we're talking about? Can you, you, know, can you mail me something? Can you send me an email and show me how you do it? Visual language. Auditory. You know, it just doesn't ring a bell for me. I need to talk to some friends and hear what they have to say. So their, their modality of communication is listening, auditory versus kinesthetic, right? More feeling oriented. You know what I'm talking about. When you talk to someone, they're like, oh, I had such a hard day. I felt like I was just climbing the mountain of success and it was so hard, like a 50 pound weight on my back, right? And they use this language that expresses feel oriented versus visual versus auditory. Now there's no right or wrong in any one of these, but you know what I found? In my opening, I could connect and instantly find out with this person a fast talker or a slow talker and immediately adjust my pace. And then secondly, inside of the first question, I'm listening so intently. Are they visual? Are they auditory? Are they kinesthetic? And if they, if they give me more of a feeling vibe, then I'm going to use the same language that they're using. If they're more visual, I'm going to use the same language. And I'm doing all of this in the first 60 seconds. That's how you build rapport. Major point number five, you ready? 
Speaking of, you always want to be testing opening lines. So we get caught sometimes in just using our presentation. You know, and again, 7,500 hours, three years of making phone calls. Oftentimes, you know, using the same presentation over and over again. And sure, I might adjust it if I was calling New York versus Toronto versus Miami versus Cleveland. But the reality was, like, the Prezo was kind of the Prezo. But after a while, I started noticing that if I didn't adjust my opening, if I didn't test new opening lines, because things are changing, the market's adjusting, consumers' behavior is different. Look, reminder, no one is sitting there saying, God, you know what? I'm super busy. I hope someone calls me and interrupts my day. No one's doing that. No one's like, do you think someone's going to cold call me today? You think someone's going to prospect me today? No, no one is doing that. So you've got to test openings that create engagement, openings that create listening. Like I, I wrote down four just things you can play around with. Hey, I've got good news for you. Hey, it's Tom Ferry, Banana Real Estate. I've got some good news for you. And then you deliver the good news. Hey, it's Tom Ferry, Banana Real Estate. I've got some bad news for you and the neighbors. Bad news. I think bad news, by the way, will outperform good news because, I mean, my goodness, just watch the news. The third one I wrote down is, hey, I'm sure you're aware. Hey, Tom Ferry, Banana Real Estate, I'm sure you're aware. Your neighbor's just home, 15 different offers, blah, 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 blah. Or, hey, Tom Ferry, Banana, did you hear? And again, I'm using these hooks, these, these lines. And I'm, again, I'm just giving you samples, right? You're going to want to be testing this all the time, especially if you're calling the same type of lead source over and over again. I want to test 10 with this opening, 10 with that opening, 10 with this opening. Which one got the best response? Then make 100 with that one. Does that make sense? A little more, yeah, a little more analytical, certainly for some of you, but think about it, right? I don't want to just, I am not a mindless get on the phone, bang, 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 phone, 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 dial, dial, dial. Like I treated every person I was calling like they were going to become the most important client I'd ever have. I was on a coaching session last Sunday morning, Gino Blafari, the CEO of Home Services of America. And he's like, Tommy, do you remember the first time you cold called me? And we were laughing about it. He said, he said, I'm busy, I'm managing, I'm doing my thing. And here's this kid smiling, enthusiastic. And he said, and I am a well-trained salesperson. I knew everything you were doing, all your Jedi net, tr your Jedi little tricks. He said, and I loved them all. And we've been friends ever since. Because every phone call I made, I was thinking, is this my next Gino Bafari? Is this my next Maxine Gallons? Is this that next client that I could work with for the next five decades? That was my mindset. So I was willing to test and adjust and not be myopic in my approach. All right, number six, make it fun. If you're gonna be on the phone, you gotta make it fun, right? I used to close my eyes and imagine myself on stage. Like that was, that was fun for me. Maybe I'm weird, right? But look what I do today professionally. Or I sometimes, yes, you heard your first on a podcast, I would imagine the client naked on the phone, right? So all you hear is a voice and you're like, I wonder what this person would look like naked. And this is what I was thinking while I was like having a conversation, right? I'm slightly ADD. Or I am kind of dating myself with this one. Uh, two of my clients, uh, Alan Schaffrin, Stephen Christie, we would laugh about this. They would literally, and then of course I had to do the same thing. They would make phone calls. Do you remember, um, if, you're, if you're younger than 35, Google this. If you're north of 35, you might remember movie phone. There was a time when we had to call an 800 number and it would say, welcome to movie phone. If you want to see the latest Star Wars, press one. And you would press one and then it would prompt you all the way through to buy your tickets or to find out where the movie was playing and at what time. It was a phenomenon for a while. It was hysterical. Well, these guys would get on the phone at the end of the day and literally, you know, Dial a prospect, the person would answer and they'd say, welcome to real estate phone. If you're thinking about moving, press one. And every now and then they'd hear beep and we would just, we'd laugh our ass off, right? You gotta make it fun. You gotta make it fun. You gotta make it fun. All right, number seven, 80, 10 is your time schedule. 80 minutes on the phone, 80 minutes on the phone, 10 minute pattern interrupt break. Go outside, get a glass of water, go to the bathroom, do what you got to do, and then get back on the phone for another 80 minutes and a 10-minute break. So I was going 80-10, 80-10, 80-10, 80-10, quarters in a day, four quarters in an NBA game, four quarters in the NFL. Like that was my mindset. Four quarters of the day, how do I optimize every one of the quarters? All right, number eight, just a few more. You ready? You want to memorize your presentation. Think about this. You want to be an appointment setting machine. So I'm calling people, hot leads, past clients, online leads that are coming in, people I met at an open house, people that referred to me. When I'm on the phone with that person, what is the single most important thing I've got to be doing? The answer is I've gotta be listening. I've gotta be listening. I don't wanna be talking. 
I want to know what I'm going to ask. I want to know the questions I want to ask. I want to have them completely internalized so I can spend all of my intention, my attention on the person I'm talking to. You've been there before. Maybe your spouse, maybe a date, maybe a friend that you're having a conversation with them, but their eyes are looking over their, over your shoulder as if something better or someone better is inside the room. And in that moment, how do you feel? But how do you feel when that person locks in on your eyes and you know you have 100% of their attention? How do you feel in that moment? I think of the words trust, connection, commitment. Heck, I'd even throw love in there. So I argue that if you don't memorize your presentation, you can't put 100% of your attention on the prospect because you're thinking about what you're going to say next how you're gonna get them, you with me? Versus, I wanna be present right now with Rich in the moment, how can I help, listening intently, I, I know my presentation inside and out, twice backwards, I know the questions I'm gonna ask, I can dance with it, I don't have to fall it verbatim, it's just a skeleton, I can play with the framework any way I want, but the only thing that matters is what is going on with that customer in the moment. Couple that with some of a few basic rapport skills and you're gonna win. Number nine, ready? You wanna engage people through open-ended questions and really what I wanna say to you is you wanna listen and you wanna repeat and approve their answers. You wanna listen and then you wanna repeat and approve their answers. So Brenda, at what price would you become a seller? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're really not thinking about, I don't know, but if you were to sell, like what price would you become a seller? We'd want 550,000, 550,000 outstanding. How did you come to that number? Now, the fact that I repeated back your exact number, ideally with your exact tone, and I acknowledged it, I approved of it. That's outstanding, good for you. Wow, congratulations, don't you wish you would have bought two? The more I repeat and approve, think about it. When you repeat it back to the person, you're letting them know consciously and unconsciously that you are listening like very few people on the planet, that you are committed and connected with them. They probably have a spouse and kids and friends and coworkers that are not listening the way you are and they don't even know you yet. I will argue, my friends, I grew up on the phone. Like I, I think I probably slept at night with my headset. That's how much love I have for the phone. I remember actually going to McCormick and Schmidt's nightclub, which was a restaurant right over here by the airport, right? With my headset on plenty of times at 19, 20, and 21. Yes, I had a fake ID. And literally, because I was just so comfortable with it. Like I have that much love and affinity towards the phone. I hope you're getting that. So again, it's about repeating approving. It's about 80-10. It's about having the right environment. It's about putting all your attention on your clients. And let me give you my last one, number 10. You ready? Probably should have been the first one, but if you really want to become an appointment setting machine, you need to ask for the appointment. Yes, you need to close. And look, closing is such a funny thing because there's so many great sales trainers out there. And you know, some people say, you know, you just want to close and grind and grind and grind. And I, look, I, there's no doubt that that works. And I hear others that say, look, nobody wants to close, but everybody wants to buy. So how do you do it in an elegant way? Well, I would just argue this. What we know, right? All the studies show that 80% uh, of salespeople don't close at all, right? So you get to the moment of truth, right? You're there and you go, huh, so what do you think? And, you know, what do you think is actually the, the I don't know, arguably the most ridiculous, asinine, stupid question to ask because you're like, hey, you're probably ready to go, but I'm going to give you one more question. So what are you thinking about? And now all of a sudden they're like, shit, maybe I should be thinking about something. And you actually plant a distraction in their head. So if you ever find yourself saying, <laughs> what do you think? Please don't ever do that again. That's what amateurs do and you're not an amateur. But that's what 80% of salespeople do. Now, if you sell real estate, remember that 87% of the people that got in the business came in with no sales and marketing skills whatsoever. And I would argue at times that most maintain that. They came in with no sales and marketing skills whatsoever. And most people maintained it. But we can do something about this. Remember my interview with Jim Quick? We can learn anything. You can become a master of persuasion and influence. But first, understand that 80% of people don't close. You see it, go, go to an open house. 
go, go into an open house and don't like not in your own town and don't declare that you're in real estate or a mortgage person or in the insurance, but just watch how most people, sh Hey, you want to look around the house? No, I came here because I wanted to stand in the kitchen. Like, what are you, like, what are you talking about? Right. And then as you're walking out, they're like, uh, okay, well, if you need any help, I'm here. Like that's pathetic, right? 80% of people don't close. 15% of people, as the study says, close one to three times. Hey, which would be better for you Monday or Tuesday at four? Hey, I appreciate the fact that you got a friend in the business. If you didn't have a friend in the business, I'd assume you had no friends. So what would be the best time for us to get together? Like whatever, right? But they're asking for the order one to three times. And 5% elegantly present their case, listen intently, put their attention on the prospect, knowing that their job is to solve problems and do it in a powerful way that you can prove time and time again. They handle an objection, two, three, four, or five. They close again. They work through conditions of time or spouses or whatever it else may be. And they close again and again and again, and they get the yes. And I guess the question you have to ask yourself is, who do you think wins? Who do you think wins? Nobody likes to be closed, but everybody likes to buy. So my question for you, I actually said this to my team, this is only gonna go 20 minutes and I'm now I think 40 minutes in, which means I'm late for my next appointment, take that. So you wanna be an appointment setting machine? What are gonna be the two or three things, two or three strategies that you're going to do more of, less of, start, stop, or just add into your business to make that happen. Look, the world needs salespeople. The world needs people that are willing to get outside of their comfort zone, try new things, talk to more people, and move the world forward. That's what you do. I don't care what you're selling, you move the world forward, and that requires appointments, my friend, so make it happen. Thanks so much for listening, and I gotta bounce on my appointment. Talk soon. If you want more information about this episode, including my show notes, mentions, links, and everything else, make sure you visit tomferry.com slash podcast. That's tomferry.com slash podcast. Thanks again and talk to you soon.